Uh, I'm David Sensor. I'm interviewing uh, Dr. Walter Orenstein on April 3rd at the CDC. Uh, Dr. Orenstein is aware that he's being uh, filmed and recorded and has signed permission for that. Thank you for coming in, Walt. Uh, do you want to tell, him, tell me a little bit about um, Walt Orenstein, your, your roots and how you got into public health? I, well, I grew up in the Bronx and was fairly limited in my travels. In fact, I spent the first 24 years of my life in the Bronx and wanted to see more of the world. I had a cousin who was an EIS officer in 1956, Harry Rubin, stationed in Kansas City, and he was the doctor in the family. And when it came time after medical school to think about service obligations and what I might do, I went to him for advice. And he mentioned by joining the CDC and the EIS that you got to travel. So based on that, I just checked it off, and I was ready to go to CDC. And when was that? This was, I graduated from medical school in 1972 and went to San Francisco to do two years of pediatrics and then came to CDC. And I was quite interested in uh, immunizations at the time because of uh, my training in pediatrics and where immunization is such a fundamental part. But quite frankly, what really motivated me most was the ability to travel. What did you uh, do in the immunization activities when you were an EIS officer? When I came to CDC, my initial focus was on uh, mumps. I think it was because I was the only I was the last EIS officer, and that was the only disease available. I had done some investigations uh, with Phil Landrigan about uh, lead smelters and toxicity in Idaho, but it was mainly mumps. And then the smallpox opportunity became available. Uh, How did was, you hear about it? Well, I, first of all, I put my name in for every international trip. There was meningococcal outbreak in Brazil. I didn't get it. Uh, Bill Fagey gave a talk to our EIS class, and he was mesmerizing and uh, almost scary in the way he could motivate people like myself. And so when I heard they were looking for people, I put my name in. I got selected to go in December of, of 1974. I was, in EI, I was in the class of 1974 in the EIS. What was your first impression when you got there? Well, this is my first real time in the developing world. I, had, I was shocked at the degree of crowding. I think that more than anything else, uh, so many people and such poverty and diseases that I had never seen before but only read about in textbooks, such as huge uh, goiters. Uh, and so initially I wondered, what was I doing here? But uh, things changed dramatically as time went on. Where were you assigned? I was assigned uh, initially to Uttar Pradesh, to two districts in north central Uttar Pradesh, just below the Nepalese border, Gonda and Baraish. And there was uh, one particular village in Gonda called Paraspur, which had an ongoing and persistent outbreak of smallpox, and that was my first focus. I was taken there. Don Francis was my supervisor, and this had been such a troublesome area that a consultant was obtained from WHO, from, uh, and for, who was actually a, a very senior infectious disease person from the United States, who had looked at that area and had concluded that the reason surveillance and containment wasn't working was that the underlying base immunity level was low and hence we needed to do a mass campaign and then focus on surveillance and containment. And what I remember uh, going there with Don Francis is he noted immediately that the reason surveillance and containment was not working is it wasn't being implemented. 
uh, people were walking in and out of rooms with transmitting cases. Uh, there was no effort to try and assure everybody got vaccinated. And so my image was of Don Francis sort of laying down the law to me uh, to implement surveillance and containment in Paris. And that was my first experience with smallpox. Uh, describe uh, surveillance in India. Well, I think it was highly variable, and the quality was quite problematic. Uh, there was uh, uh, people who claimed to have done searches and really didn't do any searching. And in fact, that's one of the things we began to implement is some sort of measure of the quality of surveillance. And what we did is fairly simple. We started to just pick people we ran into in villages and asked them, had a worker been there? Uh, did they know about the search? Did they know where to report a case? Did they know about the war, uh, reward, which was at that time 100 rupees for finding, for reporting a case of uh, smallpox? And it was terrible initially and then improved over time. How did you make it improve? I think it was primarily through focusing on layers of supervision and we would hold accountable the immediate supervisors that I supervised, and they would hold accountable the next layer. And we just kept pushing and pushing and pushing. And what they knew is we would go to the field and arbitrarily check. And that's a lot of what I used to do, is I would go to a village uh, unannounced and would just go house to house at times and look to see whether people were vaccinated, and look to see whether workers had been there, uh, look to see whether houses were marked. Uh, I was always amazed at how people seemed to tolerate people painting on their houses, but as a way of, of showing we cared. And I think it, what changed in my feeling is a recognition by uh, the workers that somebody cared and somebody was gonna look into what they were doing. You said that you started off in Uttar Pradesh. Were you, did you move from there? I, well, I started off in Uttar Pradesh, and then uh, about midway, I was there for four months total. Uh, the outbreaks appeared to be contained in the area I was initially assigned to, and then I was uh, reassigned within Uttar Pradesh to Aligarh uh, District, which is just north of Agra and uh, southeast of Delhi. Did you find the same problems? I think it was much more difficult in Aligar. I think one thing that I always found beautiful in India was the villagers. I think uh, the villagers were just, a, while there might be problems in getting some of them vaccinated, they were the hospitality, the, the, uh, the kind of spirit I found was much more pleasant. The slums of Aligar were a very different place completely. And what was ironic is in some of the rural areas, I found some of the medical personnel not uh, that interested and not organized and frankly not all that competent in some, some of them. Uh, whereas in Aligar, the medical personnel I met were out, absolutely outstanding. We were dealing with a very difficult situation. And there was just less organization in a village you had ahead person who was head of that village and it was much more structured environment. Dealing it within the slums of Aligar was much more uh, um, difficult to uh, get any leadership exerted into a particular community. But you succeeded? I, we, we succeeded and I think we did because we had such tremendous support. We had the support from high levels of the government, at the central level, at the UP level, and as we got towards the last cases, and it turned out uh, Shanti, daughter of Piari Lal, was a seven-month-old girl who died on March 16th of 1975. She was in Aligarh, uh, but she was the last case in Uttar Pradesh, India's largest state. And 
what we were able to do is we had tremendous resources. We organized a search that covered more than 38,000 houses. We had teams in our searches who just stayed by the railway stations and bus stations. We had teams that checked the beggar haunts. Uh, so we finally did it. And ironically, um, the last outbreak had no known source. It was a three-case outbreak in one of the town's busiest markets, Patha Bazaar. Uh, there were three cases, uh, and unfortunately, the last case, the girl who died from late hemorrhagic smallpox, this case could have prevent pre prevented if the father had uh, reported the sibling, the five-year-old sibling who had actually probably given the girl the smallpox. Um, it never went any further from that uh, case. There's been a book written on uh, smallpox in India called The Expunging of Smallpox from India. And his basic premise is that eradication occurred only because compulsion was used. I don't recall any compulsion in terms of how we think about that in the United States, like a mandate to go to school or or conditioning whether you got uh, benefits as a result of vaccination. There was a lot of persuasion. <laughs> and what we would do frequently in the areas I was involved in is go back to people multiple times, pushing and pushing them to get vaccinated. Uh, some people accepted it immediately. Others were much more recalcitrant. So we didn't take no for an answer as a permanent answer. We, we did push in that sense. But in general, I think people were, were supportive. I, I just don't remember the force issue. And we really didn't have that many um, avenues to enforce compulsion. So I, I don't recall that as a big issue. I think he um, is drawn from one case that was described by Peter Greeno, I don't know if you're familiar with that, but um, he described an over-eager EIS officer who charged into a house and vaccinated a child. And from that, they developed the whole sequence that it was all through compulsion. And um, I, I, I don't remember anything. What I, what I do remember is the kinds of things which I gather almost everybody did is whenever we'd find a case in a village, uh, we'd gather the village around and I would get vaccinated. I, God only knows how many times I was vaccinated against smallpox. Uh, after the first uh, uh, serious reaction, uh, nothing happened. But I, I don't remember that. I remember, as I said, going back and forth and trying to push people to get vaccinated. But I don't recall where we ever vaccinated a child without a parent's permission. I mean, there were, there were issues because sometimes the father might be in the field at the time our worker would be there in the day. And sometimes the women were concerned that the father uh, opposed it. And sometimes we had to go back at night uh, so that we had the, the father. The mother was afraid to do it without the father's permission. But I don't recall uh, just grabbing a child and, and just vaccinating against uh, that uh, parent's will. Did you ever feel physically uh, threatened? There was one time where I, I was concerned. It was um, two, one or two children who were vaccinated uh, during the incubation period of smallpox. And one of them developed uh, a corneal scarring. And the mother attributed that to vaccination. And I was clueless, not understanding Hindi, as she, she just ranted and raved. And then a number of people uh, came around because she blamed the vaccine for the corneal scarring. That was the only time I felt physical danger, although nothing ever happened. To what do you attribute uh, the success in India? 
Well, I think a, a, a big part was the dedication of the more senior level people, the substantial resources, the supervision, the, the continued overlooking of each level of the program, and uh, the resources that got made available, particularly late. I, I arrived late in the program. I arrived in December of 1974, and by then, uh, we could have almost anything we want. And towards the end of the program, when we did searches, we would do 10-mile radius searches around cases. And uh, money was not an issue. Uh, we were given vehicles. We were given petrol. And I think those kinds of things uh, made a difference in, in what is a difficult area. And the, and the area I worked on, ironically, is some, one of the areas that's been very, very difficult to uh, to eradicate polio from. And uh, Aligarh, where I worked, was the last place on Earth that type 2 polio virus has been detected. So, I mean, these, are, these were areas that were, were not easy areas uh, going uh, near last. Why did they give you the easy places? <laughs> well, what was of interest is, I don't know how I got to Uttar Pradesh. Uh, most of the people were going to Bihar. And in fact, I remember my paranoia as a first year EIS officer wondering whether maybe they thought I was inferior while I was sending, getting sent to UP and not to Bihar. And I think UP had at least, as I understand it, a better government infrastructure at the time than Bihar did. But um, this was the last, the la these were the last areas and they were, they were tough in the sense of uh, getting the, uh, in, in the rural areas in particular, getting the health department organized. I mean, even to do things that much of India was doing very well, such as knowing how to implement surveillance and containment. Are there other things about your time in India that are memorable to you? Well, I, I think th there, some of the people uh, that I remember, I, there were. I had two wonderful paramedical assistants, Masarat Hussain, who worked with me in Gonda and Baraish, and K. K. Chaturvedi, who worked with me in Aligarh. These were brilliant people, hardworking, dedicated, and a lot of what I think I did was to give them external validity. In essence. Much of what I did was to assure what they had recommended could get implemented, because they had much more difficult, difficult time, uh, difficulty in getting uh, those kinds of things uh, implemented in their own country. It was it was interesting to me how me being a foreigner gave me a stature that they didn't have when in fact they were the real experts. Even a first year EIS officer. Even a first year EIS officer. And uh, I remember uh, I, I'd let my hair grow and I had a lot more hair than I have now. And uh, I remember one place, uh, one village where they were uh, sort of giving us some trouble. I thought I was a hippie and, uh, and I remember a few jokes being made about that. You're not, you're not the hippie type. <laughs> <laughs> what? What influence did your experience have on your, your future? Smallpox changed my life. What, I, what I've said is I don't think I did much for smallpox, but smallpox did a lot for me. Basically, I had come to CDC with the idea of taking a two-year gap before finishing my training in pediatrics and going into pediatric nephrology. What I saw with smallpox is a disease, a terrible disease, with about 15% mortality in my area, disappear before my very eyes using a vaccine in an epidemiologically directed strategy. And I became completely enamored with vaccines and vaccinology and wound up changing my career path to make a career in vaccinology. I spent 26 years at the CDC. I was able to uh, direct the 
national immunization efforts for 16 of those years. And that wouldn't have happened without smallpox. It just was like an epiphany. Uh, part of my major attraction to going to smallpox was at that time CDC had a policy that you could spend two weeks after you went on an assignment like this traveling. I found for $50 more, I could say I could go around the world. Pan Am had those around the world flights at the time. And so in some senses, that two weeks afterwards was a major motivator and something I was looking forward to it. And it was so such a downer after smallpox. I mean, I, I realized when I was doing it, I was living history. I realized that I would never again in my career ever have this kind of feeling. I knew it, and in fact, up until today, it's still there. I was so dramatically affected and feeling I was making a, a real difference and helping to leave a legacy for forever. And uh, it's one of the times that rather than being a bureaucrat, I was a hands-on, I was actually doing it. And it's still the highlight of my career. I think that's a good way to end. Great. Great.